The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hello, my name's James Wrigley. I'm a financial advisor and one of the principals of Melbourne-based financial planning firm, First Financial. I've been a long-term listener and contributor to the Ensemble Group and podcast, picking up some amazing nuggets of gold over the years. And through this podcast and the people that I'm able to speak to and interview, hopefully I can continue to deliver some of those nuggets of gold to you. We have entered a new era of advice with a continuing advisor migration towards smaller and boutique licensees. This new era places a premium on professional development, sustainability, and efficiency. But many smaller practices are finding these goals increasingly out of reach, as it becomes harder to access CPD in a way that is both affordable and makes efficient use of their time. The Ensemble All Licensee Professional Development Day was created to meet this challenge. Born from the thinking of the Ensemble Advisor community, it's a licensee agnostic, one-day CPD event giving you access to 10 hours of CPD accredited content from leading industry experts. You can join this event virtually or join us in Sydney for the in-studio experience. To register, head to ensemble.com forward slash ALPD. Hello, welcome back to the podcast. I feel like I haven't recorded one of these for a a little while, but uh, Delene Jacovides, thank you for joining me. Marzi Wealth, is that how I got it? Marzi. Marzi Marzi Wealth, yeah, that's okay. (laughs) We just tried to do it before press record and I buggered it up. Sorry. Um, okay. I think let- most people can't say my name a lot of the time anyway. So when I was thinking about the pronunciation, I was like, you know what? They can't say my name. It doesn't matter if they can't say my business name either. At least I can spell it quite easily. <laughs> so what? what's the story behind the name? What's, you know, it, it's yeah. it's not no, some, something financial. Like what's, yeah, what's in the story in the name? Well, it's very hard to find a name. Firstly, that is not taken already. (laughs) Um, And I wanted to pick something that was a Greek word, ideally, because I come from a Greek family. Mm. Um, And then finding a a lot of criteria, Um, trying to find a word that is not super long and hard to pronounce. So I ended up coming up with Mazi, which means together in Greek. Um, Nice. The idea around it is like, yeah, I'm obviously taking quite a collaborative approach with clients and working together with them to build and protect their wealth and all of that. So that was kind of the vibe I was going with. How often do you find yourself explaining the the name and the story behind the name? Uh, Not too often, actually, because I do have it on my website and on like a client brochure and my Instagram and things like that. So people usually come to me and they'll actually say, that they loved the name and the meaning behind it. That actually, they've come to me because they like the values I've got. I guess oh, fantastic. Yeah. yeah, and I guess financial advice is one of those industries where pe- people are coming to you because of you. It's, yes. it's not so much you know you, you you work for this big brand or something like that. Sure, maybe in the past when the banks were involved, that 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 happened a little bit. But certainly these days, people are coming to you because you're you and you've I don't know you've been totally. on the podcast or you've done your Instagram or or whatever it is. Uh, so, t- so tell us a bit about about the business. How long have you been a- around for? How long have you had it for? Yeah, just about two and a half years now. So, oh, so I've been, yeah. yeah, I've been in the industry for about 16 years, I think it is. Yeah. Um, I've been an advisor for, I don't know, about 12 years. I'm kind of losing track now. <laughs> um, but I was an employee before, so I've worked for a few different types of businesses. So I started my advice. Uh, career, I guess. I started in a small business and worked for one advisor doing power planning and admin. And then I went to Sun Super and worked in their call center giving general advice and then moved into their advice department. So I was there for about a year and a half. Yeah. Um, that was a really good introductory to becoming an advisor because it was scaled advice, um, foreign advice, which is very hard to do. Uh, it's really hard to build rapport with somebody when it's like quite transactional like that. Yeah. Um, but it was a great introductory into advice. And then I thought if I want to be an advisor, I have to leave the super fund environment, go work for an advisor. So I Googled best financial advisors, Brisbane and found who I wanted to work for and contacted them and made that happen. (laughs) Um, and then I was there for about four and a half years, um, had my first child while I was there, did my CFP. And then I decided um, that I was having my second child. I wanted to kind of take a sidestep. So when I was pregnant with my second child, I moved 
um, businesses and went to NGS Super um, to back into industry fund land, but I was giving comprehensive advice. I just got the leads from the industry fund Um, and there was no advice department in Queensland at the time when I moved there because they had just merged with another super fund. So I kind of got that up off the ground. So that was a really good learning opportunity as well. Um, but then after I had my second child, I was on mat leave. I thought, okay, I'm going to give it, you know, my daughter's when she's two, I'm just going to rip the bandaid off and start my business because I thought I'm always going to wonder what if, if I don't do it. Um, so yeah, it's only been two and a half years now since I've had my business and yeah, yeah it's going really well. Has that, as the desire to have your own business, what did, do you think that was always kind of sitting there in the back of your mind or, or did it just happen no. more recently? Yeah, I don't. It's hard to say because I do come from a family, a family of business, like the small business owners. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's kind of like in my blood, I guess. <laughs> um, but I had always seen the headaches that my grandparents, my parents had, and so I always said I was never going to have my own business. But then I guess it got to a point where once you become like a bit more of a senior advisor, you know, wanting to do things your own way and have a bit more control and things like that. And so, um, I, yeah, I just, like I said, thought I'll always wonder what if, if I don't give this a go. And, um, it was in, in the back of my mind for a few years, but just wasn't the right time when I was having young children. Um, yeah. So I just kind of put a line in the sand and said, when I get to that point in time, I'm just going to do it. And I did. Yeah. And I suppose, you know, there's always the there's always the bit of a fallback that you can give it a go and if it doesn't work for you for whatever reason, yes. you can probably go get a job back being an advisor for NGS or someone else in, in, in a fun yeah. planning firm anyway. So you've always got that fallback. Always say that to advisors. I was speaking to another advisor last week um, and she's ha- also had her second child and she wants she's spoken to me a number of times over the last couple of years. So to what's the worst that happens? Like, yeah, you might lose a bit of money in the setup and, you know, and maybe not make so much money while you're – setting up the business but worst case you give it a go and if you don't like it just go back to being an employee so go give it a go life sure what what what's financial advice like in super fund land like i've i've never experienced it but how do you, how is yeah you, you mentioned you're doing comprehensive advice there yeah. i had what's it like it, it, how, how different same, is that is it how different is that compared yeah. to working at a financial advice business same as what you're like you're probably doing um probably exactly. less yeah probably less um around like entities and tax kind of structures and things like that. But mm-hmm. you're still doing like from there's a lot of retirement type plans. Um, so you're doing a lot of, you know, transition to retirement, um, withdrawal recontribution strategies. Um, yeah, like you're still helping with estate planning. You're still giving you're giving very comprehensive advice. Yep. Um, if they've got non-super investments, you're still advising depending on who you're licensed through. Yeah, I was still advising and all of that. Um, I often helped with a few SMSF closed down wind ups as well and, and consolidated those. Um, and I guess the, the key difference though is when you're in, employed to, uh, employed by an industry fund, you're trying to keep the funds in the fund. I would have thought so. Um, but uh, if the partner was with another super fund, that was fine as well. If you wanted to leave them there, it was very, you know, strategic type of advice rather than product focus. So yeah. similar to what and, I do now. And, and still the and, and still the scope to help on issues and assets and things that might be outside of superannuation because that had always been. I said I've never worked in super fund land, but but that would all always be. I would have felt restricted if it was like, hey, you can only provide advice in relation to the superannuation fund that you're working yeah. for. Uh, I I couldn't cope in that type of environment. Yeah. But if you've got the scope to help with external assets and things, well, then fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. How do you find – so tell, tell us about the, the clients that you're working with now. Like have you been really selective with who you're working with or did you go through a stage in, in, in starting up your business where you kind of just took whatever work you could get? Like how have you dealt with yeah. that? That's a good question. So, no, I didn't take on everybody. Uh, so I have had the luxury of being a bit selective on who I've taken on um, because I had a social media presence before I started my business. So um, I'm on Instagram. I've had that account for maybe four years. So I had it going for a couple of years and had a few thousand people on there. Obviously not the size of your um, social media. I'm following James. Um, but yeah, still plenty of uh, work available and leads coming from that channel. 
Um, so I decided straight early on that I wasn't going to give scoped advice or scaled advice. It was going to be comprehensive. That's yeah. how I best operate. So if anyone came to me for insurance only advice and things like that, I'm not the advisor for them. So I would refer them on. Um, and I guess typically, uh, or I guess over time I have uh, worked out pretty quickly that they did need to generally be higher income earners or have a bit of an asset base to kind of work with. Um, so yeah, not really working with people that don't have too much in terms of financial stability already, um, just because like the cost of advice is, you know, an investment. So they need to have the capability to build assets quite quickly or already have built some level of assets to warrant that cost of advice. Gotcha. And and are you, is it just you providing the advice? Like, would you have, what's your sub, kind of business support like in a power plan and client services? Like, it has, what does that look like for you? Yeah, from day one, I've used outsourced power planning. So I am not a power planner. Um, I'll have never pretended to be one. So I have not written <laughs> one document um, in the last two and a half years since I started my business. Yeah. Uh, so use outsourced power planning from day one. I feel like my time is better focused on seeing clients and bringing in business that way, yeah. not getting bogged down in the SOA work. And uh, I've got two full-time VAs now. So I took on one about 10 months into business and then I took on a second one uh, about, I don't know, in the last six months. I can't remember exactly. Um, so, yeah, I've got plenty of help from an admin support perspective, but I'm the only advisor in the business. So, yeah, I try and spend most of my time seeing clients rather than doing admin, which I don't enjoy. <laughs> was that was that scary, like taking that first kind of full-time uh, no, it, it, it support there, like you mentioned, power planning from day one. But yeah, but that first one, kind of ten months in. There's other people that I've spoken to. They, 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 they've been really worried about. But maybe it's it's more so kind of onshore staff. But yeah, they've been really worried about. Oh, can I actually afford this person? Is it going to be okay? Am I going backwards? And then yeah, they find like two or three weeks later, they're like, oh, why the hell didn't I do this so much earlier? Like, yeah. what what was your story like there? The same thing. I was super nervous and especially with hiring an offshore as well. That was quite scary, but went through VA Platinum. I had plenty of support with them to do that. Uh, So obviously there's lower cost ways of doing that too, but I chose to go through the structure or the the pathway that had a bit more support around it. And I actually did have to get rid of the VA within her probation the first time. So Mm. the two that I've got were not were not the original one that I had. Um, so like that was an experience in itself. Uh, but yeah, it was very scary to do it. But again, I just feel like you can't grow if you don't <laughs> invest in other people into the business. You can't do everything. And yeah, um, yeah my time is better spe- spent elsewhere rather than filling in applications and things like that. So um, yeah, I'm hoping to bring on somebody onshore next, uh, like an associate advisor. Um, one of my VAs is starting to learn how to write plans just because I find um, the turnaround time with outsourcing is not as quick as I'd like it. So um, my one of my VAs who is actually an advisor in the Philippines, um, so she's very smart. Um, she's starting to learn how to do more basic plans to start with and she's doing really well. So yeah, you can't can't grow unless you hire more people. And um, I also don't want to be working, you know, 80 hour a week. So (laughs) I've got to get other people to help me. Is that what you're doing now? 80 hour a week? No, 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 no. I'm not. That's what I'm saying. I don't want to do it. That's why I hire people. (laughs) How do you, like, how do you, like, how do you kind of manage your time, limit your, you know, inquiries? I imagine you're getting a a bit of inquiry through Instagram and and, and other means. Like, do, do you limit the number of new clients you'll see each week or each month like how do you how do you manage yeah. that yeah I've had a bit of a wait list for a while to be honest um and I did interview another advisor recently but we just weren't 100% the right match um so yeah I'm always open to growing the business if the right person comes along um yeah. plenty of work there to support it I can't get through the work fast enough so I'm in a very privileged position um, but essentially, yeah, people are on a wait list at the moment and then um, every, you know, couple of months I'll open up some, you know, new slots and let people through and, um, yeah, so that's kind of how I'm managing things because I found uh, in the, at the start I was, you know, letting everyone through and I couldn't keep up and it just meant, you know, delayed turnaround times in terms of 
writing advice and implementing and things like that. So yeah. now I'm trying to be a bit more um, like slow the pace down a bit so we're not getting lost in it. Do you, do you have, like how many do, do you have a number that you do each month, or or you just have, once I'm kind of through this bit of work, then I'll open the doors to a few more people, and then you get through that work, and then you open the doors to the next group. Yeah, ideally, I'd like to have a number in my mind, but yeah. because I've been like growing with the VAs and trying to teach them yeah. new things, like it's not quite there. Um, so it's more around just when I feel like I've got I've got a handle of what's on the books at the moment, then we'll look at bringing on the next few people. Um, yeah, good. Yeah, so not an exact number. Um, and also, as you probably know with advice, like sometimes you bring on new clients, but then there's a bit of a delay anyway because of things going on in their world. So you might bring them on, but then you've actually got to wait a couple of months before you can finalise things. So if you just limit the number of people per month, yeah, you might be you might have to just open up extra spaces anyway to kind of yeah, fill that spot yeah. when they're delayed, if you get what I mean. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you find, like I, I noticed on your, I you know, went on your Instagram before we, we started recording, I, I noticed that kind of reference to the wait list. Do, do, you, do you find people that mind about this idea of you're on a, you're on a wait list? Yeah, people so, have been fine with it. Like some people, so. yeah, some people will, will like uh, contact me again to say, has it, have we, has it progressed any further? <laughs> uh, but I, you know, do send them some resources uh, when they do join the wait list. So, um, you know, they get the client brochure, they get an introductory video, FSG, all that kind of stuff um, to kind of go through. Uh, also give them access to a mini course I kind of created in terms of um, just working out like goals and values and, um, you know, a bit more lifestyle stuff and then also a bit of a cash flow course. So if they want to sit down and kind of work through some things uh, beforehand, so they've got that to work through. Uh, Not everyone seems to take that up though. That's There's probably less people that actually sign up to that um, free resource. Um, which surprised me. Um, I thought, but I think the people when they come to me, they're usually time poor um, people that want to outsource that, you know, work to an advisor. So they're they're really not doing too much DIY. <laughs> what's your what's your, so when you decided to, you, you've opened the doors, you're going to take on a few more clients. What what does your process look like with working with them? Yeah, so we have an introductory call just to double check that. We are the right fit, um, and uh, you know, hopefully, they would have already in in the um, introductory call booking. We say like you must have watched the introductory um, video, which is about seven minutes and talks about our process and you know what we do and things like that. Yeah. Um, and the client brochure, which outlines fees and things like that. So um, by the time they get to that introductory call, they're like usually primed to go. Yeah. Um, so we have an introductory call to double check it, reiterate the process, costs, things like that, um, and also just find out a little bit about their situation in case there's anything you know curly in there that I might not want to give advice on or yeah. can't, like you know overseas pensions or something like that. Just kind of explaining and setting the expectations. Yeah. Um, and then after that, if uh, we're all in alignment, then I'll send them a link for a discovery meeting. Um, so have that first meeting and then, um, I usually do a strategies meeting as well. Um, because I come from a very, you know, strategic strategy kind of background. So I use buoyant modeling, um, and show them how they're on track at the moment. What is it? Really? Buoyant. Buoyant. No, never. Yeah. There we go. I'll look that one up afterwards. Oh, that (laughs) is excellent value. Clients love it. It's super visual. And it's super user friendly. Like I mentioned, I'm not a power planner, but yeah. uh, Voyage is so easy to use as an advisor. And you can literally model things on the spot with the client as long as it's not too complicated. And yeah, so we do a bit of Voyage modeling together and then talk through some different strategies, you know, the pros, cons, tax implications, all that kind of stuff. And uh, then after that strategies meeting, go formalize. Um, the recommendations in an SOA and then yep. help them implement it. So yep. that's kind of that initial process. And then, yeah, ongoing reviews for those that are choosing to do that. Have they, so by the time someone gets to that strategy meeting that you're having with them, you're doing some modeling, have, have they paid you anything up until that point? Mm-hmm. They yeah. usually pay 50% up front and then oh, yeah. the other 50% when the advice is uh, written. And do you charge for the yeah. discovery call? That discover- oh, that's discovery included. Meeting? Yeah, that's included yeah. because um, 
that's why, you know, they've already kind of had a few touch points before they've got into that discovery meeting. So they know what the cost is going to be for that they paid, um, they process. Paid, they've paid half of it before the discovery meeting. Oh, I usually just do it at the discovery at, meeting. At the discovery yeah, meeting. yeah. But like I've never had anyone come to that discovery meeting and then disappear and not pay me. They've yeah. they've always come to that discovery meeting knowing that they're paying, you know, whatever thousands of dollars it is and <laughs> um, paying for half of it up front. Yeah. Yep. And and then so you you do your discovery you you eventually do your your advice. What is what is your statement of advice look like? Because I, I I saw what your Instagram story just before. It looked like you were doing a Loom video for uh, something, whatever it was you were talking about. Like is that was that part of your advice an advice presentation? What was that about? So my SOA is a paper or the traditional SOA yeah. that Loom video I was recording is actually when it comes to insurance renewals. Um, oh, yeah. So just to help be a bit more scalable, um, I've recorded some videos, some Loom videos to explain how they can read their renewal statements and some of the things to consider in terms of the checklist um, that is attached to the email, you know, if has your income gone up or received an inheritance or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, and also just a prompt, uh, I will just remind you about if you're paying some from super, you're going to get a rollout in your super, don't panic, like this is part of the plan. <laughs> yeah. um, so it's just a reminder because it's, uh, yeah, people do often email and say, oh, my God, there's a rollout happening for my super. Like has someone stolen my funds? And it's like, no, it's on your insurance premium. <laughs> so <laughs> um, just like reminding them of those kinds of things. Do you manually do that or is your CRM somehow set up to, to trigger to automatically send that email when it's getting close to the renewal date? Yeah, I haven't figured out how to do an automatic thing like yeah. that. So okay. it's the VA is doing it. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, have, I feel you got, like, have you got anything like that? Like, a, no, no, no. Because no, I'm okay. like, I'm just you know, like, just in my own process, and this is like, I really enjoy doing these podcasts because I, <laughs> I get to steal bits of your process and <laughs> try, yeah. try to do things. But, but you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm maybe a little bit behind in, in, in that sense that I'm trying to look to do some videos for the risk profiling exercise yeah. that we go through with clients. So at the moment, that's a meeting. So, so my process, there's a phone call. We do an initial meeting, charge three hundred and thirty dollars for that initial meeting. If there's a, if they agree to go ahead for with advice, yeah, we, we do some research and stuff. And then the then the second meeting in the process is uh, is mainly that kind of risk profiling type discussion, with a bit of checking off on a few questions that we might have had be- between the first few meetings and maybe yeah. in discussing the strategy. But it's just. It's, I'm just asking the same questions over yeah. and over and over. It's, a, it's a different people, obviously, but I'm asking the same question over and over. I want to try and push that to a, a video and have a video explaining the questions. They'll get a yeah. the questionnaire. They'll send me the answers. And then in the meeting, we can talk about what do their answers mean in terms of yes. advice that we're putting together. Try and pull that part out of the process. But like you, as you said, I'd, I, I, you know, just been thinking about this in the last week or so, really, but I feel like will clients actually watch the video and do the questionnaire? Because like, my clients are like yours. They're, they're coming to me to you know, put a time in the diary and help them sort this stuff out. I don't yeah. know if they're going to sit at home on a Tuesday night and watch the video and do the questionnaire. <laughs> <laughs> I've tried this already and I'll, I'll be interested to know if it works for you, but I I I have a video recording for the risk profiling and I've tried it. And um, I just find that client my clients, because they're usually um, you know professional families and things like that that have got kids, they don't have time to be watching videos at night time. Once the kids are asleep, they're exhausted, yeah. got no mental capacity. So I find what's works best for us. Um, my discovery meeting goes for about an hour and a half. Um, and in that, we do our risk profiling in that meeting. And, and it is repetitive. It, it does um, get a bit boring, but I find the better outcome is you just do it then and there with them. Because if you send them something to do, you're waiting weeks for them to do it, if at all. Um, so I'll, I'll be keen to know if it works for you, but I found it hasn't worked for me, but I think other businesses it has worked for. So maybe they're just a bit stricter with like, you can't work with me unless you do X, Y, Z first. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. That, that, that must be the difference here is that that's, you know, I, I thought it would be a really good idea to push that part of the process just, just to speed the process up a little bit. Yeah. But, um, yeah, that, that was the thing that I, I, I haven't done the videos yet, but as I was, as I was thinking through it, I'm like, hey, will people actually do it? And it's interesting to see that, that they're not for you. So you present the advice, uh, uh, it's a, it's a paper, 
PDF, I, I imagine. Yes, so do you, PDF. You, you're working from, do you work from home like where you are now? You're yeah, 100% from primarily, home? Primarily, but I do have a, um office space that I just rent a day office from when I do have people that want to see me. Um, even though I am online, I still have about 50% of my clients Brisbane-based. Okay. Um, so I think that is a combination of things. So firstly, I did have a bunch of clients that have followed me from previous businesses. Yep. Um, and they were mainly, yeah, Brisbane. Um, also I had an amazing accountant that used to refer me some great work up here. Um, so he's now being promoted to like a state manager or something. So I'm not getting those leads anymore. <laughs> but, um, but it sounded like past tense when you yeah. were talking about this accountant. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, it is, but the clients that he had referred me um, over the last couple of years have been really great. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that. And then I think um, also just the word of mouth from the existing clients. So I've ended up with, yeah, about 50% of my clients in Brisbane. Um, and then the rest are interstate. And yeah, don't always get to get around to every state. Um, but Victoria and Sydney are the next biggest states, as you would imagine, given. Mm. The wealth. Population. Yeah, and the population, yeah. So so the Brisbane clients, do you see them in person or are you doing them online? Um, a mix. So yeah. a lot of them still want to see me online because it's more convenient for their schedules. The ones that I do see in person are typically the older clients, um, so like the retiree type clients, and they just prefer that. Um, as you can imagine. <laughs> exactly the uh, same here. Yeah. yeah. So I'm a bit flexible and it does mean that you've got to be kind of um, a bit adaptable as well with your process because, yes, yeah, sometimes you might get your VAs to send things off digitally then other times I'm like scanning stuff and sending it to them because I've got a wet signature. So you've got to kind of be a little bit adaptable in that regard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw. I did, did you just get a new big, big new printer or something? Is that what I saw? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just <too> bad. Yeah. <laughs> about that. So, how do you like? Where do you, do you have your sights on? Like, what's next for you? It, it sounds like you're you're pretty busy by the sounds of things. Like, what's what's next? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do think it would be a smart move to um, hire an associate advisor. I think um, that would really help free up my time in terms of putting together, you know, strategies and things like that for power planning um, to allow me to see more people. I am also interested, like continuing to look into ways to be more efficient. So looking at, I've been trialing different ways to file notes with AI and things like that. Like I mentioned, continue, continuing to record different videos and using Loom, that's always been really successful for me. So um, just continuing to try and build efficiencies. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think maybe one more employee, I'd be, um, I think I'll be that would be a good size for me. Um, yeah. yeah. And then uh, like that's that's it for ne- that's the next step, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> have you, the, the file note thing, have you, have you found anything that's working for you? Can, anything you can share there? Not yet. I tried um, Fireflies and I didn't yeah. love that. And I am interested to try Copilot next. But as you know, every time you do anything new, you just kind of need the mental space to focus on it. Like if you're signing up to a trial or whatever, you want to make sure you're trialing it properly. So I haven't got to that yet. I've tried different things like recording via Loom and chucking the transcript into chat GPT, but then it was too long and chat GPT freaked out. So yeah, I've tried a few different things, haven't got there. I saw Adele Martin did a webinar recently. I haven't had a chance to watch that. So I'll be interested to see what she suggests because I know she's quite savvy with that. But yeah, if anyone else has any suggestions out there when you listen to this, feel free to reach out and give me your advice. And what other what other bits of your process and your business have you got like little video recordings for? So there's like a, a kind of a welcome to the wait list and this is what to expect. Yeah. Uh, you just talking about the insurance thing. What, what else have you got? Anything else there you can share? Um, yeah, I've got a few other different videos that I use like Division 293 tax. So mm. sending that to people that I know or expect might get a notice around this time of year. Um and a financial year kind of checklist and things like that outside of the advice that we might I might give them personally. Um, so they're more general advice videos. Yeah. Um, but yeah, lots of I've got to do have a number of videos because sometimes people might email me asking a question and it's like, well, here's a video to watch to learn more about the 
you know, the things to consider. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, that's been quite successful. I think it just it does take back a little bit, a bit, little bit of time. Um, yeah, which has been good, yeah. And are they just Loom videos? You're just then sharing them, yeah. the link to the Loom video to them? Yes. That's a great idea. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to steal that one from you. <laughs> yeah, I think it's really good. Clients love seeing your face on there. Like like you said, they want to come see you. It's um, So if they can hear from you, I think that's important rather than just reading an email. Yes. I know personally I prefer to listen to things while I'm doing something else. So if I might, might be cooking dinner, mm. might listen to a, a podcast or webinar at the same time or whatever it is rather than reading an email. Emails I get lost with me because there's too, too much in there. So I'm never <laughs> if you can listen or, yeah. So you're, you're two, two and a bit odd years in, are you, are you glad you made the jump to, to your own business? Yeah, absolutely. Like There are obviously some weeks that are um, – you know, <laughs> are, are very hard, uh, but overall, really happy. I made the the jump. Um, not looking to go back. I had that other advisor ask me that the other week, um, and uh, yeah, I'm looking looking forward to seeing where the profession goes um, in the future. It'll be good to get rid of some of the red tape and yeah, <laughs> compliance and things like that. So I am really hopeful for the future. That's you know why I'm still here, and you know, sixteen years later. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we'll just have to wait and see, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I, 16 years later, but it's also 16 years not doing the one thing. Like you've had different yeah. things, you know, you've been different jobs. I think that the that keeps it interesting for you, different jobs. Obviously now your own thing, so you take a bit more ownership and pride in, in that than maybe you might have in, in previous jobs. Well, I kind of just, well, I don't know, maybe it depends on the person's work ethic, but I felt like I worked just as hard when I was an employee and that's yeah. why it kind of it drove me to start my own business. I thought if I'm working this hard to somebody else and building their asset, why not do it for myself? True. So it probably does depend. Um, but I think having your own business, you probably understand more about why certain things are done and, <laughs> you know, the overheads around it and things like that so there's a bit more of an appreciation i think yeah yeah i hadn't thought of that i guess there, there would be a sense of uh, now i understand why you know that thing was that way or why we couldn't do this particular thing yeah so you're, you're you're living and breathing it yourself whereas uh you know, i personally haven't had to deal with any of that type of stuff um yeah but yeah. I, I do, like I said, in terms of like my, my work ethic, I think because I have come from uh, families or business owners, mm. I kind of already got things. And I think my employers always really appreciated that I was always quite fair with my approach to things because I could see their side to things a lot of the time too. And it wasn't just me being like a, you know, an employee, you know, making demands or anything. <laughs> I was, yeah, I was like quite balanced with my approach. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Look, Delene, thanks for joining me this afternoon. Uh, for anyone that wants to get in touch with you or has got anything to share, where can where can people find you? Um, you can find me on LinkedIn under my name, Delene Jacobides, or your yeah, Instagram is where I hang out a lot, Muzzy Wealth. Um, otherwise, uh, you know my website, muzzywealth.com.au. Easy. We'll put some links to some of those in the, in the show notes if anyone wants to get in contact with you. Thanks Thank again you. for joining me. Thanks for having me. Bye now.